first test as a firefighter had nothing to do with fire. It's 1994, and after a ridiculous amount of work, I finally landed my dream job as a firefighter. I worked really, really hard, and I realized that I was entering a man's world. So as the first female hire, I was totally excited to be part of the team. However, not everybody shared my sentiment. A few weeks later, I'm reporting for duty. <clears throat> It's shift change, so there's twice the number of guys as normal. Half of them getting ready to go home, the rest of us reporting for duty. I'm standing in a dorm room just off the kitchen, and I can overhear a couple seasoned firefighters. This morning, I'm the topic of conversation. I hear one of them say, she's too small to be a firefighter. I freeze in my tracks. Another one chimes in, yeah, make sure your wheels are up to date, boys, because when it hits the fan, she's not going to be able to pull her own weight. Training did not prepare me for this. Should I go in and say something to them? Or should I pretend I didn't hear any of it? Just then, over the loudspeaker, I hear Firefighter Varela to the district chief's office. What now? Nobody else is getting called to the district chief's office. Did I forget something? Did I miss up? Am I getting fired? I take the longest walk of my life down a cinder block corridor. I open the district chief's door and find him sitting behind his desk. He waves me in. How you doing, kid? Fine, I said. Partly as a statement, but really mostly as a question. Shelly, firefighters are like tools in the toolbox. You don't need eight hammers. You might need a hammer. You also need a screwdriver, a ratchet, a wrench. Do you hear what I'm saying? And I could tell I was supposed to be on the same page as him, even though I had no idea what he was talking about. So I nod my head in agreement, and a minute later, he dismisses me from his office. A few weeks later, we're back at the fire hall, and we get a call for a car accident. When we arrive, we find a car upside down on its roof, between east and westbound traffic, amidst crumpled metal, shattered glass everywhere, we find the driver suspended upside down by her seatbelt. She's semi-conscious and bleeding. My crew makes the, seat, the area safe, the, stabilizes the vehicle, but the problem is we can't make direct contact with the patient. So I walk around the rear of the vehicle and I notice where the roof is crushed down and the rear window is blown out, there's a small void. And I think to myself, I think I'm tiny enough to fit in there. So I show my captain, he agrees, if you think you can get in, like let's give it a try. So. I slide inside the vehicle and am able to make contact with the patient. With myself on the inside and the remainder of my crew on the outside, we manage to release the seatbelt and gently lower her onto a backboard and safely slide her out. We found out later she had a fractured neck. And it was then that I realized what my district chief was talking about. I had made the mistake of thinking that because I was a girl in a boy's job, and because I'm only five foot two, that what made me different made me less. But in this instance, it made me valuable. Because a belief in a limitation is more powerful than the limitation itself. And today, I'm gonna to share with you three lessons that will completely change the way you look at limitations and the impact they have on your life. The first lesson is bravery builds backbone. I learned this lesson in grade school. I'm in Mr. Wright's grade five math class. I am a scrawny, geeky, undersized runt of a child who hates being the center of attention. This particular day, we walk into Mr. Wright's class and on the board, there's a math problem. 
He instructs us to sit down, work out the problem, and in a few minutes, we're going to take it up as a group. I sit down and I start my work. And Mr. Wright is pacing up and down the aisles looking at everybody's paper. He settles in front of the chalkboard and he calls the class's attention. And then he locks eyes with me. Miss Barella, what answer did you get? And I can feel 20 sets of eyes burning a hole in my skull. And I just want this hot seat to be over. So as quickly as I can, I tell him my answer. 10. He paces again. Did anybody get a different answer? And kids' arms are going up in the air like arrows. And one by one, he starts fielding answers from different students. And everybody got the same answer. But their answer was three. Miss Farella, he says, it would appear that you are the only student to get 10 as an answer. Would you like to keep 10 as your answer and run the risk of being the only student who is wrong or perhaps right? Or would you like to change your answer and join everybody else? During the longest, most uncomfortable silence, I see the corners of his mouth turn. And finally he says, congratulations, Miss Barella for being brave enough to stand on your own and for being the only student who arrived at the right answer. When I was a kid, I always doubted myself. I was so shy. I hated being the center of attention, but in that minute, I realized when you're brave enough to stand out on your own, you're able to achieve excellence. The second lesson I learned is certainty creates character. And I learned this lesson from a legendary blues guitarist and my dear old daddy. It's 1998 and I've just moved out of my parents' house. Every Sunday we start going for breakfast. Every Sunday my parents pull up in a clunky old Buick, we pile in and we go to the local breakfast dive. But every Sunday I notice my dad has on the CD player the one the only, the legendary, Mr. Stevie Ray Vaughan. Now, my dad and I share an insane love of Stevie Ray Vaughan, but week after week, and then month after month, I realized my dad is not listening to a collection of Stevie Ray Vaughan CDs. He's listening to the same CD. So one Sunday, I've had enough. And never being once and is a perfectly good opportunity to make fun of my dear old dad. I said to him, come on, dad, switch it up, man. Like, there's so many other great musicians. Try another blues guitarist. And I'll never forget what happened. He slows the car to a stop. He turns and stares at me with a look that can only be described as a combination of disgust and horror. And he says, this is still good. Conversation over. Because he was right. He was certain about what he loved. Years later, it's 2010. I'm standing in my kitchen and my phone rings. My mom says, Shelly, your dad has lung cancer. I thought I was going to pass out. In moments like that, a million thoughts go through your head, and then boom, I went into firefighter mode. Okay, what do we need to do? What do we need to do first? Let's run the place, figure it out. Let's get this done. But I learned that not everything is a solvable problem. And over the next 10 months, I watched my dad get weaker and weaker. But the one thing that never changed was his attitude. I would go visit him, and he would ask me the same thing every time. What fun thing did you do today? If God help you, you better have an answer. When he was admitted to the hospital for the final time, that one thing remained true. He was not interested in his diagnosis. He was not interested in his treatment. He wanted to know what was going on out there, 
And what fun thing did you do today? On what would be his final night, I sat at his bedside with my friend Sarah. At this point, my dad can't speak. He can't even swallow. Sarah and I smuggled in the sacred Stevie Ray Vaughan CD. We popped it in the laptop and we cranked the volume. I'm sure the nurses were wondering what was going on in palliative room number five. But with what little strength my dad had left, he raised. My dad was certain about what he loved. What do you love? Because when you are lucky enough to know what you love, don't apologize for that. Let it light you up. The third lesson I learned is perception creates reality. So then this lesson at 12,000 feet. When you lose somebody you love, it creates this void in your chest, and that was definitely true for my family. And I wanted to give my mom something to make her feel brave and bold. So one day I said to her, hey, Ma, let's go skydiving. Now, at 72 years old, I do not imagine my mother's going to throw herself out of a perfectly good airplane, which was fine, because I didn't intend to go skydiving either. So when she said to me, well, you know, Shelly, I thought about it when I was younger, but, but that time has kind of passed. That's exactly what I thought she was going to say. But what she said next shocked me. She said, actually... Actually, I think I am going to come skydiving with you. And I don't want to watch you jump, so I'd like to go first. <laughs> Not what I was expecting. So the next thing I know, there we are in the airplane. The worst turbulence I've ever experienced in my entire life. I look out the window, and the wings are almost flapping. The instructor told me later, we should have even been in the plane. The altimeter's reading 12,000 feet, and there's kind of an air of chaos in the plane because we're getting ready to jump, and then we're held up. Whoa, 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 hold up, guys. Hold up, hold up. We're over water. You should kind of know when you're over water. So we wait, and then we're getting ready again. Hold up, hold up, guys. Hang on, hang on. Just wait till the turbulence calms down a little bit. We're in the belly of a cloud. Now, as a firefighter, I know what it feels like to be in a seemingly chaotic situation, but really, you sort of have stuff under control. This was not that. <laughs> the pilot yells out, okay, guys, we have, a, we have a small window. If you guys are going to jump, you better jump right now. The green light goes on, the door rolls up. My mother, spider legs her way over to the edge of the door, huge instructor strapped at her back. I'm sitting behind her, trying to comprehend the stupidity of this idea. And before I can have another thought, she's gone. <laughs> I have three immediate thoughts. One, that could be the last time I ever see my mom. Two, my mom's a serious badass. <laughs> and three, Oh crap, now I have to jump. So I make my way over to the edge of the door. I'm looking down on a cloud. I do not want to jump. I also don't want to stay in this rickety plane, but I'm worried sick about my mom. The next thing I know, the instructor hurls us out into the air. We're plummeting through the clouds. And for a second, it was the most alive I've ever felt. About a minute later, we land. I go running over to my mom to see if she's okay. I find her sitting on the grass, 
hair blown in 27 different directions, biggest grin on her face. And she says to me, that was the best day ever. <laughs> because what happened was she changed her perception, and in doing so, she changed her reality. Perception is reality. Perception creates reality. And when you choose a different perspective, you can change your reality. Because a belief in a limitation is more powerful than the limitation itself. When you behave bravely and when you stand out on your own, you can achieve excellence. When you are certain about what you love, do not apologize for that. Explore it and let it light you up. And when you choose the perception that supports your dreams, I can't becomes how can I? And hasn't been done before becomes hasn't been done yet. I invite you to challenge the way you see limitations because the way you thought about limitations yesterday does not have to be the way you see limitations now. Thank you.